This is Kenny Roberts. Clearly you have nothing better to do than listen to Soupcast. Welcome to the surface of Superbike Planet. The SuperbikePlanet.com podcast, Soupcast, is brought to you by American Honda. Hey, welcome to Soupcast. This is Soupcast 88 for September 10th, 2009. The Eldana story. Peering out at the vast prairies at Heartland Park in Kansas last month, I saw a racing series seemingly dying on the vine. You could not walk anywhere in the paddock at Heartland Park without someone telling you of yet another cutback or pullout for 2010. In fact, the weekend culminated with Matt Maladden announcing his retirement from the sport of motorcycle racing. For me, there was an uplifting moment at Heartland Park, though, when, walking down past that sad Moto ST grid, I recognized a pair of eyes inside of an Arai helmet, saw a short, stocky body attached to it, inside a pair of leathers with a skeleton on them. It was, believe it or not, David Aldana. Yes, David Aldana a star in the cult film On Any Sunday, and former factory racer for BSA, Triumph, Norton, Honda, Kawasaki, and who knows how many other manufacturers. Aldana was brought up and taught to be fast at Ascot Park in the late 60s, and he never lost his personality on the way to factory rides and winning the Suzuka 8-hour World Endurance Race. There are generations of riders and, and others in the motorcycle industry who have their own Aldana stories to tell. A rival to Gary Nixon, Dick Mann, and the guy who was the last person to teach Eddie Lawson anything on a road race bike, Aldana has no problems telling stories about his exploits, good, bad, or indifferent, in racing, even those where he doesn't shine too brightly. Aldana, as seen in On Any Sunday, is fun-loving, dedicated, and fast. He remains the eternal 14-year-old in some respects, even though his age has to be creeping ever closer to the big 6-0. He is still faster than 95% of the riders on any Pro-Am grid, and can be faster than that if properly motivated. Ten years ago, I spent a week in France with David Aldana, and then later hung out with him for an afternoon in Southern California. In Santa Ana, he took me to the spot. I think it's at the corner of Broadway and McFadden, where he carved the words David Aldana, world champion, in the freshly laid cement in the sidewalk when he was just 13 years old. It was still there in the late 1990s. Going to France with Aldana in the late 1990s was interesting because Aldana remains a minor celebrity there. France is mad for endurance racing, and Aldana had ridden a Honda at the Boldor or at Le Mans in the 80s, and the race was televised on French TV. Aldana said his bike died on the back of the course during the race, and he pushed it all the way back to the pit garage so the team could fix it. It was live on television, and they centered on him pushing it. So, it wasn't like the paparazzi stalking Brad Pitt, but every once in a while in France... We'd be sitting at a table outside a restaurant, and a citizen would walk by, do a double take, and then ask Aldana if he were indeed David Aldana. We were there on a fairly boring Kawasaki press junket to ride a new bike at Paul Ricard, and having Aldana along really livened things up uh, in more ways than one. One of the things about Aldana, the little curiosities, is that he always has to drive. Always. If you're going somewhere in a vehicle, then Aldana has to drive. If he doesn't, if he's not in control of the vehicle, he immediately gets motion sickness. He said that as a rider, he had long ago taught his brain to process every bit of information in detail that his eyes sent while he was racing. And that carried over into the street as well. If he wasn't driving, he had to sort of pretend he was driving so as to not get sick. He would stare out the front of the windshield, sucking in everything. There are people, everyone knows one, who have an amazing internal compass. Even without a map, they can look up and see which way the sun is setting, where moss is growing on a tree, and which way the water flows down a toilet, and based on that info, can find the hotel no matter if they're in Ramini, Osterslieben, or Daytona. 
Aldana has this gift, although he says he got it from his hobby of racing passenger pigeons. Another long Eldana story we don't have time for. The guy that Kawasaki assigned me and my fellow press goons on this junket did not, at all, have the internal logistical gift of the compass. He was quite the opposite, in fact. And he would not let Eldana drive the minivan that we were all piled into at the Nice airport. So things didn't get off to a smashing start for David nor us in France. But they did in the end. This was a worldwide press intro at Paul Ricard, and Kawasaki had filled a local country club hotel with press goons from the world over. The place was near palatial and included a huge and beautiful golf course, big dining hall, and bar. When we finally reached the hotel, after seemingly hours and hours on all of the back roads all over France, with Eldena nearly constantly badgering the idiotic Kawasaki driver, Do you know where you are? Do you know what the signs mean? Can you read a map? Do you even know how to drive the entire way? Everyone was tired from traveling, tired from David, and the stress-filled drive through the countryside. We later met downstairs for dinner, the American contingent of seven or nine people, plus some Kawasaki USA execs, and we all started walking towards the dining hall. On the way, we walked right into a contingent of British journalists walking the other way. Now, Aldana had a somewhat acrimonious relationship with the British, it seemed. After having ridden for BSA and Norton and Triumph and God knows who else in the 1970s, in one inclination or another, and then there was that whole match race business from the 1970s to the mid-1980s, and Aldana was on most of the American teams back then. When the two contingents met in the hallway, it was like a scene out of West Side Story, a true Jets and Sharks moment. Only here, Aldana was the leader of the Jets. He and some British writer by the name of Jimmy, who had a near cartoon level of hair exploding out of his scalp, went chest to chest. Aldana said something like, Oh, look, the British. And Jimmy said something similar back at him. It was a tense few moments, although I never knew why. Don Kinney smoothed things over by diplomatically brain-sponging all the British riders about every bike they'd ever ridden, every race they'd ever done, every street and trail by their house, and everything else that they ever heard or knew. It's what Don does. I assume that after that, they were so exhausted that violence was not possible. We were trucked to Paul Ricard the next day and let out on the new bike. There were no incidents of any kind at the track. About once an hour, Aldana would put a version of his race face on and throw down an insanely fast lap. The rest of the time, he just seemed to be riding around, looking for where the photographers were. We had some time to kill after the track day. David Aldana with time to kill is never a good thing. Or maybe it is a good thing, it seems. We had lunch, the bunch of us, at some sidewalk cafe, and Aldana, bored, told a story about bringing Freddie Spencer to France when he was just like 18 or 19 years old. Aldana said that Freddie had not acclimated to France very well and was a bit put off by the local custom of bringing your dog with you into the restaurant and seemingly everyone in the country smoking cigarettes constantly. Okay, Freddie was a bit of an anomaly for an American racing in Europe back then. Kenny Roberts had been there before him and Roberts, for sure, knew how to have a good time. Spencer was infamous for later when he rode for Honda in GP and was winning the world championship, making sure his girlfriend had a hotel room at each GP so she would not have to sleep on the couch in his motorhome if you get my drift. Eldana said that Freddie was over to test a world endurance bike or ride the world endurance, but he couldn't remember of that time back in France. But he did remember Freddie was being a bit pissy about being in France one sunny afternoon back then. So Aldana, ever the gentleman, brought him down to the beach for lunch and a little sightseeing. Aldana then described what it was like to sit and watch as Freddie Spencer, devout Christian, teetotaler, and all-around very moral fellow, as far as motorcycle racers went, looked out onto that beach in France and realized that in France, the ladies, as he called him, do not wear tops while sunbathing. Eldana still tells the story very well, ask him about it. On the final night of the affair, Kawasaki put on a bit of a party with the bar and the restaurant getting good use with all the international press on hand and looking for a way to unwind. 
I actually went to bed early and never really heard the complete story of what happened that night. But the next day, as we were loading the minivan for yet another pinball-like run through the French countryside with the Kawasaki idiot at the wheel, I heard that late the night before someone in the press had discovered that a key was inadvertently left in a golf cart. And that said golf cart was used mm, aggressively on the manicured grass of the golf course and it was left abandoned, upside down or in flames or something, in certainly a less than desirable state. Kawasaki had issued us all ID cards when we arrived, sort of like those, hello, my name is, whatever, tags you wear at a business function. And unfortunately, when the golf course people found their cart, turned it right side up and put the fire out or whatever, the cart allegedly had Aldena's ID card still in it. So we drove to Paris in the van and were to spend another night in a hotel before leaving for the States in the morning. Back then, John Hoover ran Kawasaki USA and he was along for the trip to France. The hotel had awakened him that morning with the news of the golf cart, the damaged grass, and yes, even the Aldana name tag, but he didn't catch up with us until later when we were checking into the hotel in Paris. John might have had a prior career in the U.S. Marine Corps for all I knew. I know that he was no-nonsense in the same way that the Grand Canyon is described as vast. Sure, it's a description, but it doesn't really give the full definition. John gave no crap, took no crap, and was pretty much a buck-stops-with-me kind of guy. Aldana explained to Hoover that his name tag had been lost or stolen last night, probably by the British guys, and whoever had destroyed the cart and the lawn had planted it inside. I don't know what happened, although John said later it was the biggest charge he'd ever put on an American Express card to fix the situation. I do know that John was sitting on a couch in the entryway to the Paris Hotel, yelling at Aldana over the incident when I checked in. I went upstairs, took a nap and a shower, came back down, and Hoover was still yelling at Aldana on the couch in the entryway to the Paris Hotel. It all passed in time. Aldana remains one of the coolest racers I'll probably ever know. He has this wonderfully impish and fun quality, coupled with the ability to go maniac fast and also win races. Those qualities, together, have always been rare, and they're getting more so. While you see Aldana's rivals at MotoGP races, Gary Nixon and the lot, and Nixon is always very respectful of the current crop of MotoGP riders, Rossi, Hayden, etc., I'm left feeling that if Eldana ever came across a Colin Edwards or a Nicky Hayden or a Valentino Rossi, initially he'd be very chest out and ready to play it any way it goes, a total racer. But then later he'd lean into Valentino Rossi and say, hey, can I borrow your rental car for a little while? Supercast is brought to you by American Honda.